Hey, welcome back to another episode of Detection at Scale. Today, I'm here with Mike Hanley, who is the CSO at GitHub. Mike, really excited to have you here today. Thanks, Jax. It's great to be here with you. Appreciate the invitation. So you actually have a dual title. So you're the CSO, Chief Security Officer. You're the uh, SVP of engineering as well. Could you talk a little bit about what it's like to have this dual role and, and how you really think about success in this dual role of managing security and engineering? Yeah, absolutely. It's a somewhat of a recent development. So I initially joined GitHub back in February of 2021 as GitHub's first chief security officer. So we basically brought all of the security functions together under one roof and then elevated that to being a top level function inside the company. And then we actually uh, tripled down on our investment in security not to catch up, but really because we felt like GitHub's in a unique position to positively impact, you know, the broader open source ecosystem, developers everywhere. Um, I mean, obviously, I think last week we announced we've got 94 million developers on the platform. So that's a wide uh, community that you can create positive outcomes for, um, but also to really help lead the charge on securing software more generally. So we have tripled the size of that group um, since I got here. And then about four months ago, I moved over to also run GitHub Engineering. So now responsible for all of GitHub security and all of GitHub Engineering. And, um, you know, really, it's I think it's a great opportunity. I'm happy to talk more about sort of the synergies, uh, if, if you will, or the opportunities that that creates. But, um, but yeah, it's been a great, great two-year run here so far at GitHub. I am actually really curious about the, as you've said, the synergies it creates of having security and engineering. So are they technically under the same umbrella or how do you organize the organization in that way? Yeah, so, you know, the security team um, is is basically a functionally organized group, right? So we have product security engineering, we have security operations, we have um, our anti-abuse team, which we call platform health. Um, we have GitHub Security Lab. So you can think about those as like the pillars of the security program. Um, that group all up now is just one of the functions that reports to me along with the various product engineering groups. So the groups that run, you know, our github.com platform, the groups that build GitHub Actions and our other compute products like GitHub Code Spaces uh, end up being of the other pillars sort of under the structure that all ultimately rolls up to me. But, um, you know, I do think about them as a system, right? I mean, we don't, you know, security is not often an ivory tower somewhere uh, preaching to, uh, to, to people who are thousands of yards away. In fact, the opposite is true. I think we really design security as a function where we're delivering security outcomes, guidance, advice, capabilities, as actually as close to the developers as possible so that it just sort of happens. And um, so I actually think like having the two under one roof is really works well for GitHub where everything we do is optimized around making great experiences for developers. And, you know, this shows up in how we try to support open source developers and how we support our commercial customers. But it's also how we support our hubbers internally. We actually want to make sure that this is a great place to do engineering. And I think you can have that be true and also have a very high assurance security posture as well. Like these are not actually opposing concepts if you've got a thoughtful strategy and design approach to it. And obviously that, at that vantage point, they use it specifically between security and engineering and then the, the broader position that GitHub has around um, open source security and really like ensuring that the code that, that we are uploading to the internet stays secure uh, either publicly or privately. Can you talk a little bit about the the strategy that you have as a leader in making sure that we retain the integrity of the world's like very important projects, both security related and otherwise? I really think about it as three jobs from a security perspective. The first one is, you know, I think your your more traditional uh, understanding of security, right, which is keeping the business and all the systems and people who work here secure. So this is, um, you know, kind of the the bread and butter aspects of that. Then there's also making sure that GitHub, the products and platform that we ship and operate are shipped, built, and operated securely. And then the third piece of the security strategy is really around helping deliver great security outcomes for open source developers and commercial customers who count on us. So examples of each of the three, for example, on the first one, which is keeping GitHub secure, um, every GitHub employee logs in with a security key every single day, every time they log into um, uh, to start their workday or check out privileged access to a system. So having strong security controls across the board, like, you know, WebAuthn for, um, for authentication. In the second bucket, you know, which is making sure that we build and operate securely, we've obviously got a robust product security program that includes everything from 
GitHub's bug bounty, which I think is, you know, one of the more well-known and sort of longer tenure bug bounties in the industry to uh, things like our internal red team or just our security review and security engineering capabilities, investments in, co- in core libraries, et cetera. And then the third is really things like um, GitHub Security Lab, where we're actually going out and helping create good effects in open source, whether it's talking to security researchers and helping them better connect with maintainers or actually going out and deploying our security researchers and engineers to go work on critical open source projects and partner with maintainers there or publishing security advisories for things like log4j when they uh when they came out you know the security advisory that team published went to several hundreds hundreds of thousands of projects within the first few hours of that to help power depend about um alerts that help them actually update their dependencies so really like creating effects outside the company as well that are good for those developers is really sort of the third piece of that. Across all those though, like I said, it's really a focus on making sure that the experience is good. And you know, surely uh, everybody's had the experience of like working with security teams or features that are hard to use or that feel like blockers and obstructions. And we really try to make sure that all the security that we deliver, whether it's through our products or internal experiences or the work that we do with maintainers, it's always... Uh, mindful of the experience the your partners have in that and making sure that, you know, you build that shared understanding of what good looks like, you figure out the right way to help them get things done, and you deliver the guidance in such a way where they feel like they can actually go faster because they've got that safety and security and support from the security team. Um, and this doesn't mean you don't get to not eat your vegetables, but the question is more like, how can we best serve the vegetables to make sure that it's palatable to you and it's a good experience along the way, if that makes sense. Yeah, the the way I think about that is just demystification of things that we've spent so much time learning internally, and then making that yes. democratized for everyone. Like they, yes, like Duo famously like saying democratizing security, right? Like taking something yes. that we built and then making it so accessible and easy for everyone. Yeah, and oftentimes that is a lot of a uh, um, a lot of I think what betrays like effective security programs is the the mystique or the um, you know unnecessary sort of level of. Uh, opacity when you're working with teams. And really, I, I find like the, actually the opposite is, is the most effective approach. It's to help people socialize risks. It's to make clear what good looks like. It's to have conversations about the right ways to achieve a particular standard or set of expectations from a security standpoint, really work with and enable them to get those things done so that it's easy. Uh, and we spend a lot of time on that internally, but both both for our hubbers and for for customers. And then going back to the idea of the the two teams that you manage, I can imagine there's actually probably a lot of education that happens where security is telling engineering like, hey, we have this initiative we're trying to do for these reasons. Do you find that that's a lot easier because both those teams are just under you? Yeah, absolutely. Because the, I think having a common leader in that setting is helpful because it 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 is clear what the focus is on company level objectives, right? So it's, you know, we're all at the same place. We're all trying to realize the same goals. It's not the security team is trying to prevent something from delivering an engineering. In fact, the opposite is true. They, they understand that engineering is trying to do something important and want to support them. Or conversely, engineering understands that there's an important security initiative that we need to do and figures out how to resource and drive that as well. But it's really all about having clarity of priorities at the top and security, quality, resiliency, and availability are all things that have to be true in everything that we do. So sometimes the security team is playing more of a supporting role in that with engineering. Sometimes the engineering team is more supporting an initiative that's led out of security, but having a common leader who can help them do that prioritization and create clarity on what, around what we're actually trying to do or what the actual you know effect is that the company wants to deliver, I think actually helps a lot. The thing I'm really curious about, especially with GitHub, the organization is um, obviously the whole purpose of existence is to promote the idea and democratize this idea of software development. So when you operate as a security leader, what's your mentality in baking software development into the practice of security, specifically around things like detection and response that has predominantly been like this hacked together thing? How do you think about it? I think in terms of like how I wanted to show up for our developers is we have a process internally that we call fundamentals. And it is effectively the rules of the road and things that are important and that we can't trade off for us. It's things like our vulnerability management SLAs. It's things like piping security telemetry to core systems so that we can do detection detection engineering, like what you described. Um, it's quality standards, um, you know, dependency updates. I mean, sort of the whole 
uh, in incident command readiness, for example, making sure that we know who to page if there's a problem with a particular service. Um, and that fundamentals process really governs this idea that we want to provide plenty of latitude for people to create, whether it's, you know, amazing AI experiences like GitHub Copilot, or whether it's just adding a feature to the repos page, um, we want to make sure that there is a consistent set of expectations around security and quality across the board, independent of those things. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't get varying levels of investment based on risk or novelty of the idea and things like the security reviews process. But this fundamentals program really allows us to be clear about these are the expectations that we always have. And these are the core security services that we invest in to help make sure that you can realize good outcomes on that front. And um, that ends up being a great process. I think in many ways, it's actually freeing for developers because there is no ambiguity on what good looks like on those topics. It's actually not not only is it, I think, very clear and, and very clearly published, anybody can go look anytime at any service and see what its health is against those scorecards. And, um, you know, things drift, right? I mean, I think at a certain point, like security is about getting to your expectations and managing the drift from that, right? Because you have things sort of moving in and out of compliance as part of the normal course of business against SLAs and SLOs and expectations. Um, but having a process like that where you're just super clear on what the benchmarks are, you're measuring everything and you're making it very easy to discover what is in or out of compliance with your expectations um, just promotes, I think, better decision making. I'm, I'm very much of the mind that like, I bring me the bad news. <laughs> I think bad news is just as important, if not more important than good news to help you make good decisions. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd rather make sure that we measure everything and take everything into account, uh, than look through, you know, a set of rose colored glasses or only measure the things that are perceived to be favorable. If that makes sense. And what, what are the things that you're paying the most attention to in terms of gauging effectiveness of your security program? What metrics? Yeah. Are yeah, I think on on security program, I mean, one of them is we look to make sure that we've got consistency of coverage across the SDL, right? So we look to make sure that things are going through the security review process and that we've checked all the um, uh, the various like touch points from idea to operations uh, across the security review process. And um, we will sometimes obviously like invest more in some areas than others, for example, with things like GitHub code spaces, which, uh, you know, start either the developer environment in the cloud. We will do extra work, like, for example, have a private bug bounty with some of our bug bounty researchers to make sure that we can get some extra help or testing in, in the wild, uh, so to speak, with um, with our bug bounty community. But generally speaking, we're looking for like consistency of the process. We're looking to make sure that when we make adjustments, that it actually shows up in places like that fundamentals governance framework that I mentioned. So, for example, if we find that teams are struggling to meet the vulnerability management SLA, we go figure out like what is the investment that we need to make to improve that for everybody, not just for one or two teams. Um, uh, sometimes we'll have focus drives on making sure that if we're actually going to raise a bar, that we communicate that well in advance. Um, we make clear what the new expectation is and why we have engineers on standby to actually help drive some of that work. So, for example, we recently did a... Um, a major push to actually to raise some of the standards in some of our cloud environments. And a lot of it is just around like socialization. And you, you find that actually you have substantially less cleanup to do if you're just clear about here's what good looks like, here's why, and more importantly, here's why it matters to our customers and developers that are counting on us. That's actually motivation enough for most people rather than just saying, hey, do this or I'm going to shut your service off, you're going to get a much different <laughs> reaction um, in places like that where you're not as transparent and cooperative. Yeah, and people will find ways around it or they'll Indeed. check the box in some way, right? And be like, oh yeah, I did it. <laughs> Indeed, yeah, absolutely. So in this idea on on delivering great security outcomes for, for customers, the th thing I wanted to talk to you about was just the evolution of security within companies. So at what point of a company's life do you think it's best to introduce a security team? This is a good question. You know, having um, you mentioned Duo earlier, you know, I uh, joined Duo back in 2015, and uh, not initially to run the security program because there there were I think at that point we were mostly um, people making good security decisions and having founders who came from security was was getting us to where we needed to be at that point. Um, but I, I very clearly remember the meeting that I had with uh, with Doug Song and John Oberheide to 
to go build the security program to sort of formalize and establish that to be the plank holders, if you will, to go out and um, build and expand that function. And, you know, I think like every company is different. I think the for us, it was a we are seeing and needing to formalize the process and be re- less reliant on a small number of individuals making good decisions. And we needed to actually get better leverage on that to make it easier for engineers who weren't security experts to make good decisions. Um, you know, I think that's often an inflection point that doesn't necessarily happen at a particular revenue number or, or a particular headcount number or fundraising milestone. But I do think we are seeing security roles from a leadership perspective, show up earlier. It's not always a CISO, right? It might be like a head of or a director of or a senior manager of security at an earlier stage company. And, you know, maybe you pick up a more senior or CISO later. But I think it really depends on like organizationally, what do you want? If it's if it's a small number of good, you know, IT or product security outcomes, and you're not necessarily worried about the CISO being the public face of security, if you will, and going out and talking to customers, like that there's a different need to fill there than, for example, a, you know, um, a much later stage company or, or somewhere like GitHub, where the external collaboration or sitting on boards um, of, you know, places like the open SSF are very important parts of the job and require a different set of skills and experience. So I do think it varies based on the needs and timing of the company. But what I would say is like a good guiding principle is it's always cheaper to make good security decisions earlier. It's also true that especially for earlier stage companies, very rarely is security actually the biggest risk to your future success. And it can be difficult to weigh those things, right? Like an early stage company actually getting product market fit and generating revenue is probably the biggest existential threat that they have. But this doesn't mean that you can't not do security or you'll get back to it later, right? So it's always a balancing act, I think, in organizations. Yeah, and it also depends on the industry that you play in because... Indeed. If you're highly regulated, then yes, you're baking that in early, probably more. Yeah, I think those factors... Yeah, I think those are definitely factors. And, you know, I think like most importantly is actually like listening to your customers, what your customers are telling you and what your your stakeholders are telling you. And, you know, I find that like, especially even as a security leader, like you do have to be mindful that A, you have internal customers, right? You need to make sure that you're serving them with great experiences as well and managing risk to the company. Um, but also like your external customers, your paying customers will, will definitely give you feedback on what their expectations are, whether it's legal or regulatory, like you said, um, or also just like, what are their fears or what are what are their needs or what do they need to comply with? Not just what you as a as a supplier need to provide with. So I think just, you know, spending a lot of time with customers and asking them what's off mind for that. And, it's, and certainly security has never been more mainstream than it is today. I mean, I think a few within the last few years, I think it's 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 become nightly news material. And that has meant that I think more customers are likely asking about it earlier. I do remember, you know, circa 2015, when I joined Duo, sometimes customers would ask if you had a SOC 2. I mean, today you can't get a meeting if you're a startup with a prospect unless you have a SOC 2. And I, so I yeah. think you, not to say that that's a panacea, but more just as an indication of people asking for things like that or security artifacts earlier, I definitely think that's a thing. So the theme of this show is detection. And mm-hmm. selfishly, that's my background. I, I spent a lot of time as an engineer. How do you know as a leader when it's time to build your SecOps team versus just outsourcing it to some managed and detection response program? Good question. I mean, maybe it's useful to, to frame a little bit with detection here at GitHub. Um, we have a large detection uh, engineering and response team and set of incident responders. And this is not actually so much for internal purposes. But remember, I said earlier, we really have sort of three uh, prongs to the security mission, right? There's the internal, there's security and operations of the products, and then there's creating effects um, for the developers everywhere who count on us. So necessarily, because we're not just interested in our own internal security, and we're actually looking at detecting and disrupting threats out in the ecosystem, we've got a bigger investment um, in that space, both in people and technology. Um, but, you know, I think like the, the threshold is ultimately like what it's partly driven by what you care about. I mean, if you are a platform like GitHub is, and there are other, you know, web scale platforms out there. There's going to be stuff that's so unique to your own environment that it only makes sense for you to do it in-house with specialized expertise. I mean, um, GitHub obviously has products that are ML-driven, like GitHub Copilot, but actually the first uh, meaningful and enduring applications of machine learning inside GitHub are actually in the security team to detect and disrupt threats on the platform. So for us, I think it's always made sense to have 
first party in house development and engineering work um, from that perspective. But I think for earlier companies, I mean, you have to remember that like nobody's nobody's born compliant or with benchmarks deployed out of the box. And I think that means um, you're always chasing some of those outcomes, especially as an earlier stage company. So you do need to have some ability to see and reason about health of your services when things are not as you expect them to be. And I find like a good strategy can sometimes be to start with, if you've got a small number of rules that are sort of binary, right? Like this thing should always be true. Or if I ever see this thing, it's always bad. That can actually be like a really good place to start. And whether you go to like a third party that provides a managed service, or you're doing something in house, or you're using a, um, a tool to do it, I think just like thinking through like, what are those things that are important to you? Or, or how would you assess whether a control was working or not? And would you be able to know if it wasn't effective or hadn't worked? Um, that actually, I think, forms a really good basis for like that first set of things that you should be watching for. Like a good example is you should probably never see accounts in your production environment turn off MFA. And like if that ever happens, that's probably <laughs> that's probably uh, either an egregious human error or an adversary. So stuff like that and just having those like super high signal, um, even if it's a smaller overall set of rules, uh, I think can be a great place for teams to start. Yeah, and it's never easy to build psychops from the ground up anyway. There's just so many dependencies it's, that come with it and it takes a lot of time. Yeah. And and it's tough too cuz like you can get into um you know challenges where like for example, you've got you have some detections that can be like very 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 expensive to build for like low base rate problems. So I think about like insider threat is sort of the classic case that people describe. I mean, you can throw tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of resources at detecting and preventing and responding um to insider threats, but there actually may be like high signal, easier to understand detections that are indicative not of the whole or the intention of the adversary, but of smaller, more atomic things that look like they could be either a malicious insider or an outsider who's been successful at gaining access. And I think reasoning about things in like smaller chunks rather than um, getting too exotic too quickly can can also help, especially smaller teams that are building um, their library of detections. So when we think about open source tooling, I mean, you're in such an interesting vantage point working at GitHub, and there's been a ton of really, really prominent open source security tools. So which ones come to mind as like your favorite or the ones that you've had the, the most experience with? Yeah, I uh, have built a um, detection response tool chain on top of uh, Stream Alert in a prior life, which I know was near and dear to your heart. But, you know, anything where you're chewing on uh, streaming data in real time to try to actually then convert that into a actionable user experience, whether it's like an alert that fires from Stream Alert and then a Slack bot reaches out to somebody to get confirmation that a bad thing did or didn't happen. Um, you know, how those experiences get built off of things like Stream Alert is, uh, is awesome. Uh, you may know that from my prior time at Duo, we had a bunch of open source tools that we released as well. Things like Cloud Mapper, which I think can help you like reason about your cloud footprint at scale. And the funny story actually with Cloud Mapper is actually that part of the reason we built that is that it was hard to explain how our environment looked to auditors. And so when we worked with Scott Piper on that tool, it was actually in part to solve the problem of it is too hard to explain and whiteboard your environment uh, when you're looking at, you know, basically big XML files. So that was uh, one of the initial reasons that that got built. And then uh, if I were to go back in the time machine to earlier days of my career, I spent uh, my first, uh, you know, half a decade or so at the CERT Coordination Center out of graduate school. And um, for a while, worked on the team that build, built the uh, Silk Suite, which is a um, I believe still a commonly known tool for processing uh, NetFlow and doing analytics on uh, like IP fix NetFlow at scale. And that was fun, especially early, early in my career, you know, getting started with like network security and looking for uh, malware traffic and indicators of compromise on big networks. Uh, so Silk is near and dear to my heart as well. Yeah, if I think about the early ones too, for me, it's like Snort and... Yep. Uh, Zeke and, and Sarkata and these tools, you know, back in the day. And I love open source security tools just because I feel like it gives the community a very approachable way of getting familiar with security. And you can test these things locally. You can see what alerts fired. You can understand how to tune them, how they work. And then it builds a great culture of, of security knowledge across the community and across the world. So, and these are all hosted on GitHub too, which is great. Yes. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. For years. So, Mike, this has been 
an awesome conversation. I'm so thankful we, we found the time to, uh, to, to have you on the show. Uh, I wanted to ask you for three pieces of actionable advice that you can give to other security teams listening in. Yeah, I'd, I'd say the first and foremost is, you know, we're, as we're recording the show, it's close to the end of the calendar year. And hopefully people are thinking about like learning and development and professional development, either to spend those dollars before the end of the year or what they're going to spend them on next year. And one of the things that I think has been most helpful to me in my career as a security leader is actually to go do product management training. And part of why I think this is helpful is, um, you know, security practitioners and security leaders are really good at building and putting locks on things. But what you learn as a product leader is how to be an expert on um, helping customers solve problems, or more importantly, like in a product setting, what what problems customers will pay you money to solve so that you can go build good solutions for those. But as a security leader, what's actionable about that is, you know, it's not just that you can build a lock, it's a lock that somebody needs to be able to use in the context of doing their job. So um, I would definitely recommend for security professionals and security leaders out there, but you just go to a product management boot camp or pick up a product management book and think about how to apply those principles in the context of running your security team. Um, the second one is I would say, uh, you know, Peter Drucker has this quote where he says, um, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I think if Peter Drucker had had a CISO, you know, 30 or 40 years ago when he said that, uh, or maybe even 50 years ago, uh, their CISO hopefully would have said security culture eats security strategy for breakfast. And I think uh, this is very true in like every job I've ever had, whether it's been in government or um, at Duo in the early days or later at Cisco or now here at GitHub. Um, culture and transparency and the way you interact with different parts of the business is critical. Like I think security teams that are perceived as uh, stopping or slowing things down versus helping you actually go faster and doing so with confidence. There's a big difference in how those teams show up. Um, I have a strong preference for the latter and that you really do have to work at transparency and creating that open environment. But what that enables is um, you are really extending the security team to deputize basically every employee and empower them to be part of the security process. And I think that's just a way more constructive security culture and environment to work in uh, versus the security team being scary or not somebody that you want to hear from. So I think that's the second one. Um, and then the third one, I think, is just to, uh, you know, share notes with other teams, other security leaders, other security practitioners. Um, you know, at times we can get caught up in the like, well, uh, we're really busy with our day jobs. But I think in, act in reality, a lot of times it's where I get those 30 minute bites to talk to other security practitioners and leaders where I take away a new tool or I hear about a new training or I hear about talent or I hear about an opportunity for us to partner on something that um, is delightful. So I'd say just, you know, make sure to as busy as we all are in security nowadays, especially with current climate and conditions, um, it is still important to poke your head up and, and talk to other people and other teams and see what their experiences are and what you can learn from them. Love that advice. I really am uh, happy that you quoted Peter Drucker just now. <laughs> That's <was> awesome. <laughs> I like that. The cult Security culture eats security strategy. That's that's a yes. Really cool I have quote. put that on a slide before. I like that so much. It's true, right? And it's the behaviors that you build in the company are going to be the most important thing over what you're preaching, right? It's the whole idea of what you do is who you are, right? If you're familiar with yeah. Ben's book, yep. Ben Horowitz's book, yep. it's the same idea, right? It's like yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think like yeah. you know, as a leader, right? Like being mindful then of how your team shows up, not just you as the leader, but how your team shows up because it's sometimes it can be that one interaction where somebody says, gosh, like I never want to go back to the security team again. Like you think about it in the context of um, you, you would want repeat customers of your security team. You would want a high net promoter score. They would recommend working with you to a friend. Um, and that's, you know, how you show up in those interactions, but also how the experiences that you build work for them and with them, uh, et cetera. Absolutely. Mike, it's been such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for your time and for your insight. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks, Jack. Appreciate it.